Okay, so I just want to give a short presentation about a few calculator projects that I worked on. So, um, please don't block this projector. Thank you. Is that better? Much better. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so in high school, I really wanted an HP 48GX, and I saved my money up and eventually bought one. But before that, I had one of these simple Casio calculators, um, which is, oh yeah, boo. But the cool thing about it is that it has a 286 compatible processor, and it runs a version of DOS. So you could use the same C compiler you're using on DOS to write programs for it. You don't need any headers or libraries. It just runs on the calculator. So I used that to, while I was saving up for an HP48, to make an RPN stack for it. And so it's pretty, pretty simple. It has you know, no strings or lists or anything, just numbers. But I have my menu system with different functions and stack operations. And I added a simple uh, programming mode with labels and conditionals. And so. You are good. <laughs> thank you. And so it's not, it's not really a hardware project, but I consider that kind of my first DLI project as far as calculators go. Okay, so uh, I kind of got out of calculating for a while as a hobby, and then in 2012, I saw that uh, they had come out with a new line of calculators, and I saw, wow, TI's come out with this really fast calculator. Surely they must have discontinued their old TI-83, and I was shocked to see that this thing still sells for $100 in 2012. And two weeks ago, when I went to Staples, it was still $100. Yeah, there's a new version with Python. Sold yeah. I got one from France. Oh, cool, cool. Um, uh, and this and this processor is like, I don't know, $2 or something. You can get a better processor for 2 or $3. So I thought, what if I spent 10 or $20 on a processor? Could I make something better than a TI-83? And that got me interested in making calculators. So I had never made a circuit before. So the first thing I made was a very simple uh, binary calculator where it uses LEDs instead of a screen to show the answer. And so you can key it in with ones and zeros. It has plus and minus, and it has four stack operations. So push or enter, pop, which is like drop, and dupe and swap. And so if you have made circuits before, you'll probably notice something really strange about the circuit board, which is that there are no wires. That's because if you've never soldered anything before, you might think <laughs> that's the way you should do it. Uh, so anyway, I learned a lot doing this project. And after I learned how to blink LEDs, it's not too much more difficult to write to a screen. So then I started on a second project to build a real scientific uh, calculator. So after I could write to a screen, I figured out how to read from a keypad. And then the uh, processor, or the chip I'm using in this is an MSP430, which is a neat little microcontroller. It's the same thing in the NP25. And it has 512 bytes of RAM, which is surely enough for a, a four-level stack. But I wanted to learn how to use more memory so I'd be ready to build a graphing calculator when the day came. So I hooked up this 128K chip, um, which there's no external memory interface on that chip. So you can't connect it as memory, but you can use the pins on the chip to generate signals to get the RAM chip to read and write uh, values. Uh, the problem is, though, that there's no way for you to tell the C compiler to generate those signals if you want to store some value in that external RAM. So for example, if you had two variables, like x was internal, and you wanted to store y externally, what you'd have to do is decide on an address in the external RAM for that, and then you'd have to pass the address and the, the value to a function that would generate the signals. And that works. But the drawback is, if you had a calculation like this, which is pretty simple and straightforward, and all of these are stored externally, then you would have to write this in order to get that to happen. And so that's a really inconvenient way to write things. So I made a program to parse my C source, where anything that's uh, declared between these two pragma statements will be stored externally. and so the converter changes those declarations from arrays that are stored internally to just pointers into the external memory. And then anytime you try to read or write from those arrays, it automatically generates the functions to generate the signals to get it in and out of the chip. And so that was cool because I could write the source code in this same looking way, and then it would be converted to the crazy version behind the scenes at compile time, and I never had to see this version. Uh, so that worked pretty well. This is the circuit board. Um, I couldn't fit the program onto one uh, microcontroller, so I used a second one. Uh, this is my big memory chip, and then I thought this was kind of cool. This is actually a negative uh, voltage pump because the board runs at 3.6 volts, but my LCD is 5 volts. And 3.6 is not enough for the contrast to show anything, but if you feed negative 2 volts into the contrast, that creates a wide enough difference that the characters show up on the LCD. 
Um, so I found an old piece of clad that someone was selling at like a, a flea market for like ten dollars, and I cut it up and made a case out of it. There's the everything installed, and so if you use these AA batteries for scale, you can see this thing is really huge. It's like a brick, definitely not a pocket calculator. And then there it is, all assembled, and the last thing was to build a key overlay for it, which is made out of stamp rubber. So that's cut on a laser cutter, and then I put paint down inside the um, all the keys, like this. So that was the first scientific calculator I built, and then, um, oh well, also I should say I added some cool like uh, air functions since I had a little bit bigger LCD to work with. I also have a settings page, you can change the accuracy from 16 to 32 places. You can see how much battery is left, and then I know some people say this is not the most important measure of accuracy, but it does pretty well on the calculator forensic that everybody knows. And so I think it's pretty good compared to other calculators. And so then after I finished that, I built a second one, which actually runs the same software as that. Um, but if we look back at the board that's in the first calculator, uh, uh, I wanted to make it smaller and more compact so I can get rid of the negative voltage thing if I use a different screen. Um, if I use a different microcontroller, I won't need two chips. And then you can actually get a memory chip that's SPI that's really tiny, and so you don't need all these three chips. So you can condense all that down into this. So I just have three chips on there. And uh, the microcontroller here is actually an ARM microcontroller, because NXP, for a short time, made that in a dip package, which they discontinued. And when I compared it to the MSP, it's like way faster. So it's a much faster calculator. And then um, I had some room in the flash, so I added a simple programming mode as well. It's kind of hard to catch the screen because it's a VFD, but this is the um, console program that I used to test it. Uh, okay, and then the project I'm working on now is this little tiny calculator. I want to make something even more tiny. So. As you can see, it's like uh, the size of a business card, approximately. And it's kind of like a modular design. You can unplug the keyboard and the little LCD. And it's just really simple. I just wanted to fit one, like four, excuse me, four level stack into one chip and one watch battery. I also got a 3D printer to make an overlay for the keys. And then I printed the keys out as a row so they stay pretty straight. And then the uh, the labels I printed out on overhead projection transparencies, and I printed them in reverse so that when I cut them out, I can glue them with the ink side down. That way, the, your thumb won't rub off the ink. And so, if you look at the the feature list, it's pretty simple. It's just you know roots, logs, trick functions, like like an HP thirty five, I guess. Yeah. Um, and so one thing that was cool about this is I decided to do it in assembly instead of C, because the C compiler is really good for this microcontroller. But if you do it in assembly, there's actually two add instructions, and the second one is a decimal add instruction. So you can do uh, four, a BCD calculation of four digits at once with one instruction. So that really speeds up the BCD calculations. And so one kind of fun thing is if I wanted to implement something, uh, I would like to do it in different versions and then see if I can get better, which is kind of easy to do in assembly. You keep optimizing to get it faster and faster. And so as you can see, like my first version of the quartic routine is like one and a half million cycles. Then I got it down to 186 eventually. And so part of, a big reason for that speed up is that if you look how quartic is done, it usually shows dividing the angle in half, which is what I did on my first calculator. But then I found the how that quarter works on the HP35 on Jack Laporte's uh, page. Okay. And then I asked for some help on the forum and several people chimed in to help me make this version. So I really appreciated that, it's really fast. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the last one I wanna talk about is I'm um, trying to build a graphing calculator. And so um, all the stuff I've worked with now have been microcontrollers where everything is in one package and it's kind of easy. But for this one, I wanna use a 6502 micro uh, well, processor. And so for that, you have to build a much more complex circuit where you have at least like six or seven or eight chips just to get a minimal system working. Um, and so because I'd never done this before, I decided to do something that would help me learn how the chip works. And that is to take all of those things out of the circuit and then let the processor talk to a microcontroller. So when it asks for some memory, instead of having a memory chip in the circuit, it would relay the request for memory access over USB to my computer, and I could keep the memory there. 
and it would relay the data back that was requested. And doesn't that slow things down a bit? Yes, it's extremely slow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, like, you can't you can't build a calculator like this because you'd have to carry a PC around with you. But at least to understand how the chip works and get to learn assembly and see and get the software working, that's kind of like an intermediate solution. So the program I wrote to virtualize all that stuff has all of my memory on the left so I can scroll through and see the data and what my instructions are. And then on the bottom I have my virtual peripherals. So if I want an LED, for example, you just drag and drop one on there and then you assign it to memory location and you can just make it blink without any circuitry or anything. And so in addition to LEDs, I have some other cool stuff like you know, hex display, text display, graphics, push buttons, switch buttons. You can get keyboard input. And so I combined all of these things and made kind of a primitive graphing calculator out of it. So this is like my RPM stack on the left, and this is uh, formulas you can either have them repeated on the data or you can graph them. So these three lines here are the graph of these three uh, things here. And the really cool thing about it is, is that while all of this is virtual, all of the code that generated everything and did all the calculations ran on a real 6502 that was connected uh, like this. And so. To your question, yes, this is extremely slow because if you uh, go over USB every single cycle, it's a huge delay. So what I did is build a second version where I mirror the entire 64K of memory on a microcontroller that has a lot of memory. And then it just syncs with the PC like 10 times a second so they can update. And this is uh, about 50 times faster. Um, and then another thing I did for this uh, project is I built a 6502 emulator. So uh, my plan is that as I start writing the firmware, I can uh, upload, it, upload it to the website. And if you go there, you can use the emulator to see how the calculator works and hopefully find bugs. The cool thing is that the emulator um, is built for the hardware that I'm working on. So the same version of the file that works on the website will work on the hardware. And uh, what I've set up now is just this um, version of BASIC, which people in the community created just to kind of show that everything is working and then as a developed firmware, this is where I'll put it so people can try it. And then the last part of that project that I worked on, or well, I should say this is kind of cool. This is a, a Mandelbrot set program that someone wrote for that version of BASIC. And so I got it to run on my website. And then uh, I used poke commands because you know I know where the color data is stored because it's my emulator. And then I got, made this version here. It's kind of cool. Right. Um, and then the very last thing is that uh, I worked on a memory manager because the, some, one of the disadvantages of this processor is it's really slow at accessing stacks, which you need for local variables. And so you only have three registers, and if you do stack-based addressing for your local variables, you lose one of them. So you only have two left, which makes really inefficient code. So what a lot of people do is they take the first 256 bytes, which are really fast, and they permanently attribute chunks of that memory to each function that needs local variables. And that's really inefficient, because if you permanently assign that memory to that function, even when the function's not running, that memory is taken up. So the thing that I'm working on, it analyzes the flow of the program to see which functions call other functions. And then if you find two functions where uh, they never call each other, you can assign them to use the same memory. So for example, this on the left is the worst case path through the graph that takes the most memory. And everything to the right of that is memory that has been reused. And so I think as I add more functions, uh, it'll be even more useful because as it is now, there are 38 bytes that are using 19 bytes. But I think uh, as I need more memory for more functions, this will have an even bigger payoff where you can squeeze more uh, variable usage into a smaller space. And so that's the last part of that project. So thank you. Feel like you found the right group? Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, so you asked what what I used to generate the the call graph? The big, the big, um, um, clear back, clear back. Clear back. Mm -hmm. Where you did the graph call? Uh, your your emulator. Yeah. This one or no, this one? Back. Back. Right, so that that's actually a program I made in Visual Basic. Visual Basic, yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> yes. Why the 6502? 
Um, well, because it's just a hobby and I'm not making a, a commercial product. So I work with through hole components because it's just fun and easy to solder. And there are not many microcontrollers that have a lot of RAM, but for the 6502, you can add as much memory as you want. Uh, so you can get, for pretty cheap, like 3 or $4, you can get 512K that would fit on the board. So maybe that would be good. I mean, I don't think I'd ever use that much, but for that price. Yeah, for about 8 megabytes. Yeah. It's pretty cheap. Okay, any more questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Joey.